Hello and welcome, guys. We are, uh, to say I'm excited would be an understatement about this crew we have here to talk about pitching. Um, my name's Rob Detoma, the head coach at FDU in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, I'm going to have our roundtable people that introduce themselves right here, and then we're just going to get right into it, trying to uh, uh, share as much pitching knowledge as we can. My background's not in pitching, so I'm excited to learn from this, and I hope all you guys are too. So our panel is going to introduce themselves right now. I'm uh, Jimmy Jackson from James Madison University. Um, Michael Keller, um, pitching coach at Illinois Wesleyan University. Peter Larson, I'm with the Minnesota Twins and the Cedar Rapids Colonels. I'm Steve Atkins, I'm the pitching coach at FDU. All right, so uh, basically the, the thing we want to get out of this, this is not going to be geared towards recruiting high school kids. This is for any pitching coach, uh, summer, high school, college, we hope, um, or pitcher that just wants to keep up with what's going on. And I think we have a wide range of levels here. But the one connection that every coach has on this panel is we all sat at the same desk next to Tony Rossi at Siena College, and that is our connection. I was trying to get him to hop on here, but he's busy right now, sunbathing in Florida. So we'll, we'll let him be for now. But um, let's get right into it, guys. Uh, I'm going to gear this first question towards uh, Pete from the pro side, and then we'll go from there with whoever wants to chime in. But um, – Pitch arsenal, pitch design, these are kind of catchphrases, I would say, nowadays. But um, for someone that doesn't really know what that is or how exactly pitch arsenal and pitch design would be developed, what can you give us on that topic? Absolutely. Uh, pitch arsenal, I'll start with that first. Um, I always thought, you know, what misses barrels? Uh, what's the pitcher's strength? What does he do uh, well, best, and the most? So, um, if you don't have any tracking devices, I uh, kind of want to gear it more towards if you don't have anything, um, but it would just be charting and seeing what pitches are doing better in different situations, different counts, uh, reading hitters and how they're reacting to certain things. Uh, maybe the guy has a four seam and a two seam, but the two seams getting better play than the four. Uh, you can probably see that in a bullpen setting, but tracking that, watching video, um, and just understanding how that guy's going about it and reading the hitters mostly. Um, if you don't have any technology, we're very fortunate to have a lot of different resources. Um, most people do not, um, but something really simple and basic would be grabbing a baseball, a Sharpie, and drawing a line and understanding um, how the ball's spinning and um, using that in catch play and trying to find the best way to get creative with that. Um, and also using uh, slow-mo on your phone, I think has been really beneficial for a lot of people. Uh, I like turning the phone horizontal, which would be a good little tip. So if you want to plug in your phone to your TV or your computer, uh, you get a wide angle and you can just see it a little bit better on, the, uh, on those screens. But trying to get creative with different things, um, our eyes do lie. <laughs> and so having something uh, like a slow-mo camera or um, striping a baseball can you know, kind of take you to the next level a little bit instead of just watching a bullpen and just taking a, you know, a stab at it, so to speak. Um, but understanding your arsenal too, what plays better, and then reading hitters uh, and getting good at that, I think is a really good step for someone that might not have a ton of access to technology and you're just kind of getting into it, especially on like the high school side or maybe um, you know, a college team that doesn't have the full resources. Um, I, uh, Mike, I know you wanted to add something onto that. Yeah, I just wanted to add, and I know <clears throat> Jimmy and I have had this conversation quite a bit, and you talk about technology, and I, I think the biggest thing that a lot of us deal with is, like, the budget side. Like, you know, how do you invest in some things? And, and again, with, with the price of some of these things, it can be it can be kind of crazy and definitely not doable for a lot of programs. But one thing Jimmy and I talked about is iPhone. You know, almost everybody has an iPhone. And the slow motion video on that iPhone is phenomenal. Not only whether, you know, getting away, I guess, from, from pitch design and things like that, but like you want to work on mechanics, things like that. You know, Pete, you talked about the eyes can lie. You know, when you've got that, that slow motion video, you're, you're getting, you know, you're seeing exactly what's happening. And then 
even behind Jimmy, you worked on pitch design with, you know, grips and what the hand is doing at release point to help better those pitches. That, that iPhone is phenomenal in terms of using that slow motion video and be able to use it. I know we, use, I use it a ton um, with our guys and it's, it's a huge tool. And again, it's just something everybody has. It's not like you need to go out and spend thousands of dollars on it. Most people have an iPhone or something that has that capability. Yeah, I think that's huge. And it's always something I bring up on these things is, uh, what about the smaller schools? What about the lack of budget? So, I mean, that's something we should try and remember on all these answers is how to kind of uh, equate a smaller budget. Or last thing we want is people tuning out saying, well, I don't have rap soto, so this is a waste of 45 minutes listening to these coaches. But uh, Jimmy, any, anything on that? Yeah, the one thing I was going to add um, is sort of along the lines of what, what both you guys were saying, but uh, I think – we all probably agree that most of our, most of our players, most of our pitchers are uh, visual learners or base all their learning off feel, uh, whether it's feel of the ball, seeing themselves on video, seeing their grip, seeing the way their fingers move, their wrists, whatever the case is. So I think that's why it's so important to video these, zoom in. Uh, you don't have to have Rap Soto. You don't have to have TrackMan. Uh, like Mike said, you can just use your phone. and. I think not for nothing, a lot of times you can just show a guy the video and say, this is what you did. And when they ask, okay, what, what exactly are you trying to get me to do? You show them with your hands. And then next thing you know, they're able to do it. Um, I think it's a lot. I think pitch design is a lot simpler than people are making it out to be. Um, because before we had phones and before we had videos, there was a lot of pitchers out there that had really good curveballs and really good changeups. And they didn't have access to this. So a lot of it was based off feel. So now when we just throw in the element of a phone or a video camera, or if you do have access to Rap Soto to know the exact spin, great. I think it just makes the process easier. Um, it doesn't make it impossible if you don't have the other resources. Um, if, if that makes sense, I think, I think that's all it comes down to. The more technology you have, it just becomes a little easier. Yeah, and hundred percent. And from our angle, and I'll get it. I'll shoot it over to Steve. But obviously, me and Steve every day talking in the office. We wanted to make sure our players. You know, we came into a new job. We don't know the budget. We don't know what we can spend. So we weren't gonna just spend thousands on new technology as our first wave. There was a lot of other need. But we talked every day, and Steve did an awesome job of this, and he'll explain some of it, I guess. But uh, we wanted to make sure our players and our recruits did not feel like when they played at our program or if they came to our program, they were going to be shorted any of the experience. Now, ever, you know, you could always be shorted something, but we wanted them to get the full value out of anything we could create for them. So Steve, I know to just take it away. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, would anyone love to have the Edratronic camera, you know, for those frames per second? Yeah. But you, like you guys, you guys said it well, you can get so much out of just the iPhone. Um, and it, if you haven't used the iPhone, if you're a pitcher out there, a pitching coach uh, at any level, if you haven't gotten your guys on an iPhone yet, um, looking at release points out of the hand from all pitch types, highly recommend it because there's so many things like Pete's talked about your eyes lie, you know, in real time. Um, there's so many kids that could swear when they're, <clears throat> when they're releasing a certain pitch they will look you in the eye and they'll tell you, hey, this is the way it's coming out of my hand. This is how, how I'm gripping it. And, uh, and then you look at the video and it's just not the case. And so we found that it can be, you know, extremely helpful um, for actually realizing what's actually happening with the ball coming out of my hand. And then, you know, in real time, showing them that video too. Hey, these were your last five pitches on those changeups. Here's how the ball is coming out of your hand. Let's see if we can get a different feel and try to make an adjustment right now. Um, and I, I found it to be a pretty pretty darn helpful tool. Nice. Mike, you had something? Yeah, just to, I guess, to kind of piggyback that, you know, I guess ways that, that we use, you know, our, our, you know, evaluate pitches and, and you know, how, um, you know, successful or usable they are is, is by charting, you know, and, and again, that takes, you know, <laughs> no money whatsoever. And again, you get the feedback, 
instantly during the game, you know, things like that. And if you're able to video, you can kind of compare it, but, you know, tracking, you know, breaking ball, you know, off speed, change up, whatever usage, you know, seeing what the hitters are doing, you know, every team, whether it be high school, you know, um, you know, division two, II, division three, II, division one, II, whatever pro you guys all play, you know, uh, sim games or you know inner squads whatever is going to those hitters then and saying okay hey what are you when you're working on a pitch what is this doing what are you seeing from each guy to me you know uh, pitchers and catchers you know are, are great to what are you seeing especially from a catching standpoint but e even then sometimes they're might, maybe not seeing exactly what a hitter seeing and, and that's one thing we've used a lot is going especially to our veteran hitters you know or juniors and seniors who have been in our program we've got some uh, you know good idea of what they're capable of and, and have some trust there and say, okay, what are you seeing here with this pitch? And then adding, you know, if you do have video, if you maybe do have Rapsodo, you've got those charts and you're charting all that stuff. Does it all add up to what, what, what you're seeing and, and what's being told to you? I think the charting is a huge thing that literally just takes a couple people and, and being locked in, you know, for, for a scrimmage or a game and it can, be huge because you know you may underuse one pitch or overuse another and just trying to figure out what what's going to put your guy in the best position to get as many outs as possible I, I agree totally i think sometimes the most underused tool that a pitching coach kind of ignores is the hitters and getting feedback from your own hitters as to what what guys are hittable what guys are tough to see um you know i think that's something you could really use uh, jimmy you had something else yeah, I mean, uh, basically what you guys were just saying was I think something I've always tried to do, uh, no matter if it was at, you know, Siena, Fordham here, is do exactly that. We, I would go to our best hitter, especially if they struggled versus a certain pitcher, and uh, simply ask them why. You know, are, are you not seeing this guy well? Is it a certain pitch that he throws that you have no idea? Um, so before we had access to Rap Soto. We have a, a pitcher here who has an extremely high spin and all that other stuff. And uh, we didn't need it because every time he missed above the belt, not one single hitter on our team could make contact. So it was pretty easy to see. And then afterwards, going over to our top four or five hitters and saying, uh, what are you seeing? You know, why, why do you guys keep swinging and missing? What's, what's the problem? Uh, every guy thought he threw harder. It looks like he throws harder. He, I don't know if he's hiding it, whatever. Uh, but basically the end result was, well, once we get Rap Soto, it's going to kind of back up what the hitters are saying. So it's, it's kind of like I said before, I don't, I don't think uh, you need the technology to do it, but uh, it's huge if you have it. But the one main thing I wanted to add with the, you know, with the whole pitch arsenal thing that we were discussing is <clears throat> I think whether it's pitch arsenal or pitch design, you're starting to see more, at least put out on social media, of uh, a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old working on pitch design, which is really cool. It's almost like a kid going in his backyard and trying to hit the ball as far as he can. It's, it's neat. But at the end of the day, if you can't pitch, you don't really need to work on pitch design. So if you can't throw strikes or you don't throw that hard yet, I think pitch design specifically is more geared towards advanced players. You're above average high school players, college players, even some of our guys. We've, we've taken some of our guys and uh, we have a plan designed for pitch design for them, but we haven't even put it to use yet. We've shown it to them. Hey, this is what the plan is, but you have to do A, B, and C first before we can ever get to this point. Um, which I think is key for a lot of young guys to understand is it's, it's awesome to see all these pro guys putting it out there. And, and we put stuff out there on some of our guys that are doing it. Uh, but you also notice it's not all of our pitchers that are doing it because some of them just aren't ready. Um, they're just not ready to do that because they have to learn how to pitch a little bit more with uh, command or velocity or whatever the case may be before we worry about, you know, mirroring a perfect spin curveball to our fastball, you know, or, or whatever that may be. Yeah, I think that's a great coaching point for everybody, especially, I mean, lower level, but we all see the end result. And I think as players, we all want to, well, I'm going to do that because Aaron's judge does this or Bumgarner does that. And we forget the 5 million steps you got to master before you get to the top levels of what we're doing. So I, that's an awesome point. Pete, you had something? 
Yeah, something uh, to piggyback a little bit off Mike on uh, charting. Um, something I did at Siena and Albany, uh, just because we didn't have the video resources, was I made a nine uh, box grid for a strike zone and had other pitchers chart uh, from behind that pitcher on the in the bullpen setting, and then um, kind of go back and hash it out. And that indirectly, I did it for strikes because I wanted those guys to understand the strike zone a little bit better. But seeing with different colors where those balls were going which then turns into pitch design and movement and how their ball is playing and another set of eyes. So it was a way to keep other pitchers engaged instead of just go run. But um, I think they really enjoyed it. And then it started to be a competition on how many strikes could you get. And then a lot of things just kind of just piggybacked off that. And at Fordham, we had a little bit better on the video side, uh, the center field angles, especially. So in scrimmages, we could go back and, relook at all those things and kind of we could see the strikes on ourselves, but at a school or maybe a high school where you don't have um, as much camera or accessibility, having your other pitchers take some accountability and, you know, chart each other and let them give some feedback too, I think really helps, especially when you're an army of one and you got 15, 16 pitchers and it's, you only have two eyes and it's hard to see everything all the time, but uh, because you're bouncing back and forth, if you have two mounds going or, you know, three mounds going at Fordham and we're just trying to, you know, maximize time because we have to get to the next thing and help. You know, I'm sure we'll dive into time restrictions and all that stuff later on, but just trying to get creative. But I found a lot of success. Again, it's nothing to hop on Excel and make a nine, nine quadrant little grid strike zone and have each other chart. Yeah, and that's a great point. And we'll move, it brings kind of into the next topic, but I remember being at Fordham with Pete and – yeah, you know, almost all – most staff's dynamics are three offensive guys and a pitching coach, and a lot of times it's 18 pitchers and one coach and 17 hitters and three coaches. So, I mean, we could tackle into the dynamic of trying to manage a staff, but I think the next – that brings us into our next question, which was uh, actually tweeted to us by the legendary Sean McGrath who couldn't be on this call because he has no tie to Siena, unfortunately, for him. <laughs> but um, he did bring up a good question. I think it kind of stems from what, what Pete was just saying is uh, overused buzzword in recruiting and development of pitchers is individualization. And he said, can you provide some insight into how do you make that an actionable thing? Um, so I'm going to start with Steve because I've seen him do it. Um, but I know in this day and age, and it's frustrating as a, Head coach, sometimes I'm trying to learn that it looks like in this day and age, you almost have to have 17 different practice plans for 17 different pitchers. And I know you could group a couple in there. So, uh, Steve, if you could just touch on how we at FDU do some factor in the individualization of each pitcher. Um, and then we could go around anyone else that wants to add off that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of times it just comes to – assessing what the pitcher does well already and what he really needs to work on, looking at all the important things you need to do in order to bounce. And it's not a, you know, that's not a, a sexy answer or whatever in terms of what individualization is, but um, I think that's where it starts. And, uh, you know, at that time, you know, we look at, you know, when that when that word's thrown around, a lot of times it's what exactly in the delivery does this specific guy need to do in order to maximize velocity, or uh, or even in the weight room addressing different deficiencies and things like that. But I, I mean, I think a lot of times there's there's times where you have to cut back on maybe velocity training or working on your your breaking pitches when you can't command the fastball well enough and you have to get that up to par I mean that's that's an, an aspect of individualization I look at you know maybe a guy does have the fastball velo maybe he does throw a lot of a lot of strikes uh, you know in general but he, he has a tough time putting guys away he can't get punch outs when he needs to um, and that's where I look at okay we need to work our tails off at developing a swing and miss breaking pitch or something of that variety and so you know, individualization, I mean, you could go any million routes with it. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, it, it comes down to what are the things that help us get out and, and what exactly are, are, are this pitcher's weaknesses? How can we get them back up to par with some things that are going to help them? Um, Jimmy, sorry. 
Yeah, I think uh, the individualization, sorry, is it's pretty simple, to be honest. I think it's something that probably all of us did when we first started coaching. I know I did, you know, 15 years ago, coaching in high school was every pitcher needs to work on X. So all of our bullpens this week, that's what all of them are going to do. Um, every guy the next week needed to work on Y. So every single guy worked on Y. Uh, where now, you know, now, and, and I don't really think this matters what the level is. I think it matters on the individual player. So every player is going to have their own things they need to work on, basically, like you were just saying, Steve. And, you know, so if a certain guy needs to really work on his secondary pitches, he should probably be throwing bullpens the next few weeks to just do that. Um, if a guy is solely needing velocity, then he should be designed something or planned out something over the next four or five, six weeks to only work on velocity. Um, I think individualizing them is pretty simple as long as you know every individual that you're coaching. So, and I know for us, uh, some guys' plans will overlap. You know, we might have four or five guys doing the same thing for a six-week six week stretch. Uh, we may have another four or five guys doing something completely different, but they're on the same plan. So maybe it's not, 17 different plans but it's maybe eight or nine plans for 17 or 18 guys um whether it comes down to and i'm sure all of us have guys that do some form of plyo ball throws um you know i, I think it's always big if i think you can usually tell if you look in the bullpen of a school you're playing against or a high school team you're going to recruit you can tell if things are individualized or not because if every guy is picking up the same exact color balls and throwing them the exact same way, then it's not individualized. If some guys are doing it and some guys aren't, and some guys are doing different types of throws and some guys are doing something different, then you can usually tell as a coach just watching from the outside, yes, things are probably individualized at that place. Um, but I think it comes down to everything, you know, whether it's you know, I'm sure Pete could talk on a little more. I don't know how much he could say as far as the Twins go. But with testing as far as players go, whether it's movement testing, things like that, you know, we go through a ton of that stuff with our guys, with our trainer. Then we brought in outside people and all this other stuff. And there's a lot that goes into it, but that's all individualized. Again, it's just – it's a small part, but it's something that if you watch our guys go through a stretch routine, it was something for – you know, Coach Ike to get a little used to, um, as I'm sure, you know, Rob with being a head coach now, it's, hey, we have X amount of minutes to stretch. Well, for our pitching staff, it's, hey, we need 20 minutes because like five of them probably need about 20 minutes. But then there's 10 of them that really only need like five minutes because their stuff just isn't as long. So they kind of know we're, we've almost allowed them to stagger when they come to the field in this little 20, 30 minute window for exactly what we're talking about, just individualizing things uh, for each guy, you know, which, which to me makes the most sense as far as moving forward. And that's an awesome point because uh, we were assistants together at Siena or Fordham and almost me and Pete, it's always like the same mm -hmm. dynamic happens at a team practice. You put stretch pro 30 minutes and we used to have – Coach Layton yelling, where are the pitchers as we're trying to roll into the first drill? Or, uh, so, I mean, learning from that, uh, when I hired Steve, the first thing we talked about when we got into practice planning was I, I told, you know, he, I think he was hesitant to say we need more time than was allotted in the past jobs he had. But I said, you let me know how much time we need every day and we'll, uh, for the pitchers and we'll plan the positional player arrival times and stuff around that. It doesn't always work in the time constraints of our practices within NCAA, but it brings me to a question, like how, how long does it take for you guys as pitching coaches, if, if a coach is listening to this and wants to not be the program you talked about where everybody's doing the same thing, um, pitching related, they're all picking up the same weighted ball, they're all doing the same thing. How do they group them as far as who should be doing what? How long does it take to figure out for you what are the things you look for and anybody can jump in on this first um is there anything you look for specifically that's going to make this guy have to do x y and z while this guy's only got to do y and z or is that just so 
far-fetched of a question that you can't even answer that without knowing the guys. I don't think or I don't think it's far-fetched at all. Uh, something I challenged myself to do is in the fall during individuals, more one-on-one -on -one or smaller groups was to demo all the things I thought or all the drills I thought were important and all the, I really like the J bands. Uh, so I demoed every uh, exercise that I thought was beneficial and let them run with it. Pick two or three. Um, I think that kind of knocks out the, uh, making it a little more personal, but kind of have like a bigger, I guess the analogy would be a, like a bigger toolbox and um, or tool shed. And then you make your own toolbox kind of thing where you have a variety to choose from. Uh, there's going to be some interjection where, Hey, I think you benefit from, you know, maybe we audible and do a different drill than everybody else or to make it a little more personal. Uh, but I really spent a lot of this the fall, um, the smaller group setting to kind of iron out technique um as well as what might benefit them the most but i want them to try everything um i'm sure we all do that to some extent but uh because when you get to the spring semester or your season it's awesome like jimmy's saying where you go somewhere or even you look down at your own bullpen and you have everything set up and everybody's grabbing something different or if they all have j bands then you know half of them are you know or they're in quarters and they're all doing something uh, it's something different or they like doing plyos before bands or bands before plyos just make it personal or shake your poles and you know whatever it is for that guy to get loose to to throw um i think is huge so to clarify that you basically would have you would demonstrate and lay out everything that would possibly fit into that time frame and then you let the players decide or you make everybody do everything in the beginning and then they decide <laughs> Yeah, everything in, in the beginning so they could see it, see if they liked it. And then, hey, you know, we're going to have – if there is a team defense or there is BP and um, guys need a shag or we need to be a part of defense and we only have 15 or 20 minutes um, after stretch, how can we maximize that? Um, and then picking that two or three, and then you can build off that later on. Um, but to start to give them some ownership, because I found if – they believe in what they're doing. They're going to do it a hundred percent instead of you just tell them here's 10 things to do, go do it. And they only buy into half of it. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Mike, you had something on that topic. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I feel like there's so many different, <clears throat> excuse me, levels of, of individualization. And I think it can be based on what resources, what type of, what you have access to, you know, like, I know that's one thing Jimmy and I have talked about, you know, up until this year, this year, we've never really had a strength coach. And so I've kind of used a lot of what Jimmy has done with his guys and kind of helped help our guys get some work in. Um, but, you know, just because you don't have a strength coach doesn't mean you can't make things individualized. Obviously, you can look at body types, things like that, you know, experience in the weight room. Um, you know, same thing goes for on the field as well, you know, what a guy should or shouldn't be doing. But I agree 100% with people. You know, give those guys, you know, this, this resources to this big, you know, all these different tools, things like that, show them what you think is, is beneficial, could help, and then let them kind of figure out what's best for them. And as long as guys, I think, have some flexibility and are able to kind of pick and choose, I think you'll really start to see buy-in, which I think is huge. You know, guys kind of take um, some ownership in their, in their program and you'll really start to see them kind of uh, flourish just because, you know, uh, they, they say, hey, this is what works for me. This is this is what I've seen positive. Uh, yeah, Jimmy, what do you think, Jimmy, something on that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it, it's it, very similar to what you guys have been saying, but uh, something that I think is really, really important for coaches, especially, and for players, is watch what other guys are doing. Uh, see what – I don't, it doesn't matter to me if it's the best pitcher on the team, the worst pitcher or somebody in the middle. If you're seeing somebody else do a drill or an exercise, a plyo throw, a med ball throw, a stretch, and you ask that player, you know, what does this do for you? How is this helping you? Whatever. I, I keep our guys very open and yeah, feel free to try anything. So if we have a guy go train somewhere for two months in the summer and he comes back and, He's got three new drills that he does and five new stretches. And he's one of our better players. Typically, a lot of the younger guys will say, well, can I do that? Uh, can I try that? Or anytime I've ever used the core velocity belt with somebody, 
there's always a younger guy that walks over and says, well, should I do that? You know, can I do this one? And the answer typically is always yes. Uh, sure. You know, worst case, you try it and you don't feel anything or it doesn't help and we just stop doing it. Uh, it's not going to hurt. So I think being as open as possible helps for the individualization of, of the program, basically, just being open. Yeah, it's pretty much what all you guys are touching on is getting them to buy into as long as everything you're setting up is something that's going to be beneficial to the to the player um getting them to buy in seems to be the most important thing first and foremost and then they pick and choose what they want to do off that because nothing in that set of drills is really going to harm them if they're going into it so i mean i like that but one thing that just kind of popped in my head that we didn't really discuss prior to this but i think would be the number one thing that can help coaches in general is when you have maybe it's a whole staff maybe it's a bunch of guys and you're just walking people and can't can't command anything you're doing what is what would you do so i'll start with pete from a pro perspective but um and the pros maybe you just get rid of the guy if you can't throw strikes <laughs> but in your time as a pitching coach you got a guy who you know can do it um physically can do it, has the stuff to succeed at whatever level he is. And maybe we've had plenty of guys, all of us on staffs we were on, that bullpens looked phenomenal. If a pro scout came and watched their bullpen, they're a draftable guy. And people think you're crazy when they have one inning at the end of the year because you know every time you put them on the mound in a game, you can't throw a strike or can't hit any spot. So what do you do with that type of pitcher or those type of couple pitchers to kind of way the – you don't want to – as a head coach, I don't want to talk too much to a guy that's walking everybody about walking everybody because you're putting those negative thoughts in his head. So how do you attack that as a coach and get try and get him back in the zone or more productive for you and the team? So there's, you can back it all the way up to catch play. You can see how that is. Uh, you can start with making sure that whoever they're throwing with is always having a target set. Um, and then if it translates to the bullpen and they're still dotting it up, and it's all in game, then maybe switch, get them out of the bullpen for their, their pens and have the, you know, set up a time where you could throw your pen on the game mound. Uh, maybe have some other teammates behind you um, set up a different environment that's closer to a game without, obviously you can't, I mean, maybe you could set up a live BP or to throw them a bone or something like that to, if it lines up where they're not going to be used. Uh, but try and create that environment as close as you can. Blare some music. Um, do something different, maybe just get a command trainer or a, a, a target, something visually they can always look at and challenge them with different things. Uh, I know there's some different size and shape baseballs out there that can kind of trick the body, trick the, uh, the brain a little bit um, and still throw into a target, trying to execute that. But I really like if the guy's struggling in game, then maybe it's just the fear of or the anxiety on the game mound and maybe switching that up. Um, but if it's all over the place in the bullpen, then it probably starts to catch play. So you can kind of back it all the way up uh, to when they first pick up a baseball and play catch with their partner, and they can not they can barely hit him or they're playing more fetch than catch. And you really got to lock it back in on maybe more visual target, uh, changing your sights to something different so they can try and hone that back in. More fetch than catch. I think that's a T-shirt we got to make up right there. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, yeah, that's a, that, that might be a, a, a Rossi is in, so. <laughs> Yeah, I hear that. Uh, Jimmy, you, you got something else you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, me and you talked about it actually earlier this season. I think the number one thing for me always is goes back to their eyes. I know, you know, most guys would tend to agree, I guess, nowadays. It's something that I definitely overlooked when I was younger, coaching. Never thought about as a player, ever. Um because in my mind, as long as I saw the target before I threw the ball, it was – I'm okay. Uh, something I emphasize with all of our guys is if you're not seeing the target with both eyes, not through your nose, not out of the corner of one eye, but both eyes are on the target, at least by the time your leg reaches its peak lift, then you're not going to throw for us, basically, is what I end up telling them is even if you have decent command and you are not seeing the target at that point, you're just not going to pitch because it's something that's very simple. You should be able to do it. 
99% of the guys I coach can just look with both eyes the entire time. They don't need to look down or take a peek at the grass or the turf because nobody does. It doesn't make sense to anyways. But if somebody does feel the need to look away, then as long as they see the target with both eyes by the time that leg reaches its peak, then we're good. Uh, I think it's really easy to hit something if you're looking at it, and it's really hard to hit, to hit something if you're not looking at it. Uh, and for some guys, I think it just comes down to the mental part, which all of us, I'm sure, try to practice and work on as much as we can as coaches. But the mental side of things in the sense of, like you said earlier, Rob, is if you're constantly talking to them about walking guys, that's sort of the opposite of what you want to do. So it's more so talking to them about striking guys out. Uh, I know it was something, I guess now it's been about 10 years ago, or I think the year after we coached together at Siena, it might have been my second or third year, uh, we had a really good weekend starter that he would get two quick outs, that third batter of the inning. Every single time that he got the first two guys out, he was going to walk that third batter. It was a given. So basically, we just put something in place, me and him, where your goal now is to strike that guy out. So I don't, I don't want him to put it in play. I don't want him to pop up or get him out in one pitch. I want you to literally think from the very first pitch that you throw, if there's two outs and nobody on base, I want you to try to strike him out on every single pitch you throw. And I think all it did was just get him in a more aggressive mindset. So now he becomes the aggressor as opposed to thinking, oh, no, don't do X. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's I'm going to do this. And next thing you know, he was typically striking out more guys than not. Uh, and I think that's all it came down to. It wasn't stuff. It wasn't anything other than him becoming aggressive, thinking, here it is. Try to hit it. Yeah, I think and Steve came up with an awesome thing with us. And I know Mike's got add-on, so we'll go to Mike next. But, Steve, with our guys this year, I mean, it was no secret. The team we were coming into had a million walks the year before. Uh, but there were some guys with some good stuff, and we just had to figure out. And they were, like you said, I mean, if you, if you knew a way to cure the mental side of it, we'd all be millionaires. But there's, there was so much. They were gun-shy. I think uh, prior staffs had – tried to hold them accountable for walking people in ways that hurt them mentally um, that they weren't able to perform. And Steve came up with a, we called it two out of three. And we were basically, I guess, opposite of trying to strike people out, we were trying to induce contact as early as possible in an attack uh, by attacking guys. And I, you know, we, we ended up, it took some time and we only had a 13 game season, but we saw some growth with guys who would, it was 70 pitches to get nine outs, and then it was 60 pitches to get nine outs, and it was 50 pitches, and we're into the fifth inning all of a sudden without walking anybody with the same guy over a three-week span. And I think a lot of it is they lose trust in their stuff. Like, they either give up a rocket or they walk two guys in a row and their head coach is yelling at them from the dugout. And none of that is helpful. And, I, you know, I think it was just a great thing Steve came up with. He could probably talk about it a little. But, Mike, you had something on that stuff? Yeah, you know? I mean, I just wanted to kind of piggyback off what Jimmy, you know, Jimmy and Pete were saying, you know, first off, you know, the eyes are huge. I mean, that's one thing, you know, as a young kid, <clears throat> didn't have a lot of, I guess, high level instruction or do pitching lessons or anything like that. And, and it was fortunate enough, you know, as a junior or senior to, to, to work with a guy um, who that was the one thing he stressed on. And, and I feel like that helped me so much that that's something that, um, all of our guys, you just see guys who take their head off or pick up the target late. And it's just amazing if they make that slight adjustment. Now there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, muscle memory, you know, that you always go back to Tim Tebow and how he threw the football and things like that. And he tried to change his throwing motion. It's amazing. Just guys who pick up the target late, how tough it is for them to really change that habit. You know, it's gotta be constant. You gotta be on them. And, you know, from that side of things, but I, I agree with Jimmy on, on, on the eyes. And, and then the other thing, you know, you talk about a guy who struggles with strrikes, you know, is one putting them in the best situation possible, you know, which, you know, hopefully you want to get everybody some work in the game at some point, you know, it, it you know, just depends on the situation, you know, things like that, putting them in a right, in the right um, situation to be successful. And then also, you know, what are you focusing on? I know Rob, you talked about it, Pete, Steve, you know, when you focus so much on walks, 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 
that's what gets in their head. That's what they're thinking about, you know? And so if you can focus on, you know, Jim, you mentioned striking out that third guy of an inning or, or whatever, you know, having a goal that's just saying, Hey, don't walk guys, you know, whatever it may be, Hey, we're going to go first pitch strike or two out of three, or there's so many different things, you know, you, you can, you can focus on. Um, but it's that, that positive, you know, mental talk, self-talk that they can then start to, to buy into and, and start to use themselves where they're not thinking, okay, Hey, I can't walk this guy. You know, I think that's the biggest thing as a coach. And I think a lot of pitching guys understand it. And, you know, sometimes with head coaches, it just depends because there's sometimes some not very long leashes with, uh, with pitchers. They just want them to throw the, the ball over the plate and get guys out. And, and it seems like it's in really his. Um, but being able to understand that, Hey, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and working with those guys and that positive self-talk, I think. Is huge. I feel like, uh, head coaches guys are getting a bad rep on this, uh, talk right now, but uh, I, I mean, we all saw it for the guys we worked with and worked for, I mean, but as frustrated as it is to watch a guy walk somebody is probably as frustrating as a pitching coach to watch the offense up their team not make any adjustments and not score. It's just, we all got to handle it as, <laughs> as best we can. But I think the, uh, the best thing you guys are saying is come up with some type of other thing for them to attack and think about besides not walking people to <laughs> attack it. But, uh, I mean, we can move on. I think the target thing is such an underrated visual for coaches to teach their players. I think at the high school level, if you can get them – focused on targets like we were all saying if nothing was taught to us when we were players you know, years ago but and that was part of the reason coaching with Jimmy coaching with Pete they saw how effective an offense could be at disrupting a pitcher's focus how we would run our offenses on those teams with dealing bases or even it ain't even the amount of steals it's the threat of doing something that guy has to think about something else besides his target and besides getting a hitter out, I think we all saw the effects that had on pitching staffs, uh, coaches of other teams having to teach their guys something else besides, all right, turn your head from the runner at second, pick up your target, execute your pitch. Uh, we all saw the effects of that. So, I mean, from the offensive side, we should have all saw that it's that much <laughs> of a distraction to not have your head on the target. Um, but moving on, I think uh, we'll start with Steve because one of the last things – we wanted to get into is I think a, a big thing and it, it's the delivery and what what's important to each of you guys I guess is there a certain way you teach if you had a pitcher from scratch would you have him would you want him to pitch in one type of delivery I mean we we know that's not the case and everybody kind of has a different well, not everybody but pitchers have had success from all different arm slots and all different types of deliveries and being a wind-up guy versus a just stretch guy and all that stuff. So, Steve, is there anything specific you're looking for in our guys or in future of our guys or have had success with one over the other or just get us going off that tangent there? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's what makes baseball pitching extremely fun and enjoyable. And it's, it always keeps, you know, it kind of keeps you on your toes at all times because each guy is different, each arm is different. Each delivery type is different angles, all that stuff. I mean, it's it's what makes baseball. It's what it's what makes pitching pretty cool, I think, to be honest. But in terms of what I would look for, in terms of like an ideal pitcher, I, you know, I don't know. Right? But a lot of times, I, I kind of look at um, you know the guys that come in um, in the fall. A lot of times, as freshmen, some of the the glaring things that I think a lot of times need to be worked on for college freshmen are um, guys that don't don't decel super well. Uh, specifically, that they, they don't they don't have that lead leg block um, as a really consistent part of their delivery. So you know, in my mind, when I when I think about the delivery, there's uh, a whole you know, there's a whole list of things that you're kind of looking at to make sure guys do well, and, and it's a very individualized thing. But that seems to, to me to be a, a one that, that comes up over and over again. <clears throat> and it happens a lot with freshmen as you come in because a lot of strength base maybe isn't necessarily there for them to have um, repeated and perform that type of delivery where they're blocking well with that lead leg, uh, you know, in, in their careers leading up to this point. But, you know, I – I would look at lead leg and, and how well a guy blocks. And then I, I think a, 
another pretty big thing that we tend to look at a lot in terms of something that could help guys stay healthy, throw more strikes, and throw harder. That all three of those things is what is their arm path like, and and is it kind of on time in the delivery, getting out to the release point. So, um, I mean, Pete and I over the last couple of days we're talking about the connection ball and um, started to use that with some guys on my end. He's had some experience with it, and um, you know that's that's one tool you can kind of look at arm path and, and being on time a little bit more efficient, healthy. Uh, delivery that that can help you with all sorts of stuff uh, throwing harder throwing strikes but I don't know it, there's a whole bunch of things we could talk about and I think you guys could probably touch on a million different aspects of the delivery but in my mind those are two that I think end up really helping guys um, you know when they when they come in as youngsters so a lot of times those are some of the, the ones that are most prevalent that need work, that leg block and cleaning up and making a more efficient off path. Jimmy, I'd 